Section 17 of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marian Servasi. A series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka. Section 17. The man who has mental consciousness not only feels or senses things, but he has words or mental concepts of these feelings and sensations, and may think of himself as experiencing them, separating himself, the sensation or feeling, and the thing felt or sensed. The man is able to think, I feel, I hear, I see, I smell, I taste, I desire, I do, etc., etc., the very words indicate mental consciousness, recognizing mental states and giving them names, and also recognizing something called I that experiences the sensations. This latter fact has caused psychologists to speak of this stage as self-consciousness, but we reserve this idea of the I consciousness for a higher stage. The animal experiences something that gives it the impressions or feeling that we call pain, hurt, pleasant, sweet, bitter, etc., all being forms of sensation, but it is unable to think of them in words. The pain seems to be a part of itself, although possibly associated with some person or thing that caused it. The study of the unfoldment of consciousness in a young baby will give one a far better idea of the grades and distinctions than can be obtained from reading mere words. Mental consciousness is a growth. As Halleck says, many persons never have more than a misty idea of such a mental attitude. They always take themselves for granted and never turn the gaze inward. It has been doubted whether the savages have developed self-consciousness, and even many men of our own race seem to be but little above the animals in intellect and consciousness. They do not seem able to know themselves, even slightly. To them, the I seems to be a purely physical thing, a body having desires and feeling, but little more. They are able to feel and act, but scarcely more. They are not able to set aside any physical not I, being utterly unable to think of themselves as anything else but a body. The I and the body are one with them, and they seem incapable of distinguishing between them. Then comes another stage in which mental consciousness proper sets in. The man begins to realize that he has a mind. He is able to know himself as a mental being and to turn the gaze inward a little. This period of development may be noticed in young children. For a time they speak of themselves as a third person until finally they begin to say I. Then, a little later, comes the ability to know their own mental states as such. They know that they have a mind and are able to distinguish between it and the body. It is related that some children experience a feeling of terror when they pass into this stage. They exhibit signs of bashfulness and what is commonly termed self-consciousness in that sense. Some tell us in after years that when they became aware of themselves as an entity, they were overcome with alarm, as if by a sense of loneliness and apartness from the universe. Young people often feel this way for several years. There seems to be a distinct feeling that the universe is antagonistic to and set apart from them. And although this feeling of separateness and apartness grows less acute as the man grows older, yet it is always present to a greater or less degree until a still higher stage the ego consciousness is reached when it disappears as we shall see and this mental conscious stage is a hard one for many they are entangled in a mass of mental states which the man thinks is himself and the struggle between the real eye and its confining sheaths is painful and it becomes still more painful as the end is neared for as man advances in mental consciousness and knowledge, he feels more keenly and suffers accordingly. 
man eats the fruit of the tree of knowledge and begins to suffer and is driven out of the garden of eden of the child and primitive races who live like birds of the air and concern themselves not about mental states and problems but there is deliverance ahead in the shape of a higher consciousness although but few realize it and still fewer have gained it perhaps this lesson may point out the way for you with the birth of mental consciousness comes the knowledge that there is a mind in others man is able to speculate and reason about the mental states of other men because he recognizes these states within himself as man advances in the mental consciousness he begins to develop a constantly increasing degree and grade of intellect and accordingly he attaches the greatest importance to that part of his nature some men worship intellect as a god ignoring its limitations which other thinkers have pointed out such people are apt to reason that because the human intellect in its present state of development reports that such a thing must be or cannot possibly be that the matter is forever settled they ignore the fact that it is possible that man's intellect in its present state of unfoldment may be able to take cognizance of only a very small part of the universal fact and that there may be regions upon regions of reality and fact of which he cannot even dream so far are they removed from his experience the unfoldment of a new sense would open out a new world and might bring to light facts that would completely revolutionize our entire world of conceptions by reason of the new information it would give us but nevertheless from this mental consciousness has come the wonderful work of intellect as shown in the achievements of man up to this time and while we must recognize its limitations we gladly join in singing its praises reason is the tool with which man is digging into the mine of facts bringing to light new treasures every day this stage of mental consciousness is bringing to man knowledge of himself knowledge of the universe that is well worth the price he pays for it for man does pay a price for entrance into this stage and he pays an increasing price as he advances in its territory for the higher he advances the more keenly he feels and suffers as well as enjoys capacity for pain is the price man pays for attainment up to a certain stage his pain passes from the physical to the mental consciousness and he becomes aware of problems that he never dreamt existed and the lack of an intelligent answer produces mental suffering and the mental suffering that comes to him from unsatisfied longings disappointment the pain of others whom he loves etc is far worse than any physical suffering the animal lives its animal life and is contented for it knows no better if it had enough to eat a place to sleep a mate it is happy and some men are likewise but others find themselves involved in a world of mental discomfort new wants arise and the lack of satisfaction brings pain civilization becomes more and more complex and brings its new pains as well as new pleasures man attaches himself to things and each day creates for himself artificial wants which he must labor to meet his intellect may not lead him upward but instead may merely enable him to invent new and subtle means and ways of gratifying his senses to a degree impossible to the animals some men make a religion of the gratification of their sensuality their appetites and become beasts magnified by the power of intellect others become vain conceited and puffed up with a sense of importance of their personality the false eye others become morbidly introspective and spend their time analyzing and dissecting their moods motives feelings etc others exhaust their capacity for pleasure and happiness but looking outside for it instead of within and become blasé bored ennuied and an affliction to themselves we mention these things not in a spirit of pessimism but merely to show that even this great mental consciousness has a reverse and ugly side as well as the bright face that has been ascribed to it 
As man reaches the higher stages of this mental consciousness, and the next higher stage begins to dawn upon him, he is apt to feel more keenly than ever the insufficiency of life as it appears to him. He is unable to understand himself, his origin, destiny, purpose, and nature, and he chafes against the bars of the cage of intellect in which he is confined. He asks himself the question, Whence come I? Whither go I? What is the object of my existence? He becomes dissatisfied with the answers the world has to give him to these questions, and he cries aloud in despair. And but the answer of his own voice comes back to him from the impassable walls with which he is surrounded. He does not realize that his answer must come from within. But so it is. Psychology stops when it reaches the limits of mental consciousness, or, as it calls it, self-consciousness, and denies that there is anything beyond, any unexplored regions of the mind. It laughs at the reports that come from those who have penetrated farther within the recesses of their being, and dismisses the reports as mere dreams, fantasies, illusions, ecstatic imagings, abnormal states, etc., etc., but nevertheless there are schools of thought that teach of these higher states, and there are men of all ages and races that have entered them and have reported concerning them and we feel justified in asking you to take them into consideration. There are two planes of consciousness, of which we feel it proper to speak, for we have obtained more or less information regarding them. There are still higher planes, but they belong to higher phases of life than we are dealt with here. The first of these planes or states of consciousness, above the self-consciousness of the psychologists, which we have called mental consciousness, may be called ego consciousness, for it brings an awareness of the reality of the ego. This awareness is far above the self-consciousness of the man who is able to distinguish I from you and to give it a name, and far above the consciousness that enables a man, as he rises in the scale, to distinguish the I from faculty after faculty of the mind which he is able to recognize as not I, until he finds left a mental something that he cannot set aside, which he calls I, although this stage alone is very much higher than that of the average of the race and is a high degree of attainment itself. It is akin to this last stage, and yet still fuller and more complete. In the dawning of ego consciousness, the eye recognizes itself still more clearly and, more than this, is fully imbued with a sense and awareness of its own reality, unknown to it before. This awareness is not a mere matter of reasoning. It is a consciousness, just as is physical consciousness and mental consciousness something different from an intellectual conviction. It is a knowing, not a thinking or believing. The I knows that it is real, that it has its roots in the supreme reality underlying all the universe, and partakes of its essence. It does not know what this reality is, but it knows that it is real, and something different from anything in the world of name, form, number, time, space, cause and effect, something transcendental and surpassing all human experience. And knowing this, it knows that it cannot be destroyed or hurt, cannot die, but is immortal, and that there is something which is the very essence of good, behind of, underneath, and even in itself. And in this certainty and consciousness is there peace, understanding, and power. When it fully bursts upon one, doubt, fear, unrest, and dissatisfaction drop from him like worn-out garments, and he finds himself clothed in the faith that knows, fearlessness, restfulness, satisfaction. Then he is able to say understandingly and with meaning, I am. This ego consciousness is coming to many as a dawning knowledge, 
the light is just rising from behind the hills. To others it has come gradually and slowly, but fully, and they now live in the full light of the consciousness. Others it has burst upon, like a flash or vision, like a light falling from the clear sky, almost blinding them at first, but leaving them changed men and women, possessed of that something that cannot be understood by or described to those who have not experienced it. This last stage is called illumination in one of its forms. The man of the ego consciousness may not understand the riddle of the universe or be able to give an answer to the great questions of life, but he has ceased to worry about them. They now disturb him not. He may use his intellect upon them as before, but never with the feeling that in their intellectual solution rests his happiness or peace of mind. He knows that he stands on solid rock, and though the storms of the world of matter and force may beat upon him, he will not be hurt. This and other things he knows. He cannot prove these things to others, for they are not demonstrable by argument. He himself did not get them in that way, and so he says but little about it, but lives his life as if he knew them not, so far as outward appearances go. But inwardly he is a changed man. His life is different from that of his brothers, for while their souls are wrapped in slumber or tossing in troubled dreams, his soul has awakened and is gazing upon the world with bright and fearless eyes. There are, of course, different stages or degrees of this consciousness, just as there are in the lower planes of consciousness. Some have it to a slight degree, while others have it fully. Perhaps this lesson will teach some of its readers just what is the thing that has happened to them and which they hesitate to speak of to their closest friend or life companion. To others it may open the way to a fuller realization. We sincerely trust so, for one does not begin to live until he knows the I as reality. There is a stage still higher than this last mentioned, but it has come to but very few of the race. Reports of it come from all times, races, countries. It has been called cosmic consciousness and is described as an awareness of the oneness of life, that is, a consciousness that the universe is filled with one life, an actual perception and awareness that the universe is full of life, motion, and mind, and that there is no such thing as blind force or dead matter but that all is alive, vibrating, and intelligent. That is, of course, that the real universe, which is the essence or background of the universe of matter, energy, and mind, is as they describe. In fact, the description of those who have had glimpses of this state would indicate that they see the universe as all mind, that all is mind at the last. This form of consciousness has been experienced by men here and there, only a few, in moments of illumination, the period lasting but a very short space of time, then fading away, leaving but a memory. In the moment of the illumination, there came to those experiencing it a sense of in-touchness with universal knowledge and life, impossible to describe, accompanied by a joy beyond understanding. Regarding this last, cosmic consciousness, we would state that it means more than an intellectual conviction, belief, or realization of the facts as stated, for an actual vision and consciousness of these things came in the moment of illumination. Some others report that they have a deep abiding sense of the reality of the facts described by the report of the illumined but they have not experienced the vision or ecstasy referred to. These last people seem to have with them always the same mental state as that possessed by those who had the vision and passed out of it, carrying with them the remembrance and feeling, but not the actual consciousness attained at the moment. They agree upon the essential particulars of the reports. Dr. Maurice Buck now passed out of this plane of life, wrote a book entitled Cosmic Consciousness, 
in which he describes a number of these cases, including his own, Walt Whitman's, and others, and in which he holds that this stage of consciousness is before the race and will gradually come to it in the future. He holds that the manifestation of it, which has come to some few of the race, as above stated, is but the first beams of the sun which are flashing upon us and which are but prophecies of the appearance of the great body of light itself. We shall not here consider at length the reports of certain great religious personages of the past who have left records that in moments of great spiritual exaltation they became conscious of a being in the presence of the Absolute, or perhaps within the radius of the light of its countenance. We have great respect for these reports and have every reason for believing many of them authentic notwithstanding the conflicting reports that have been handed down to us by those experiencing them. These reports are conflicting because of the fact that the minds of those who had these glimpses of consciousness were not prepared or trained to fully understand the nature of the phenomena. They found themselves in the spiritual presence of something of awful grandeur and spiritual rank, and they were completely dazed and bewildered at the sight. They did not understand the nature of the Absolute, and when they had sufficiently recovered, they reported that they had been in the presence of God, the word God meaning their particular conception of deity, that is, the one appearing as deity in their own particular religious creed or school. They saw nothing to cause them to identify this something with their particular conception of deity, except that they thought that it must be God, and knowing no other God except their own particular conception, they naturally identifying the something with God as they conceived him to be. And their reports naturally were along these lines. Thus the reports of all religions are filled with accounts of the so-called miraculous occurrences. The Catholic saint reports that he saw the light of God's countenance, and the non-Catholic reports likewise regarding God as he knows him. The Mohammedan reports that he caught a glimpse of the face of Allah, and the Buddhist tells us that he saw Buddha under the tree. The Brahmin has seen the face of Brahma, and the various Hindu sects have men who give similar reports regarding their own particular deities. The Persians have given similar reports, and even the ancient Egyptians have left records of similar occurrences. These conflicting reports have led to the belief, on the part of those who did not understand the nature of the phenomena, that these things were all imagination and fancy, if indeed not rank falsehood and imposture. But the yogis know better than this. They know that underneath all these varying reports is a common ground of truth, which will be apparent to anyone investigating the matter. They know that all of these reports, except a few based upon fraudulent imitation of the real phenomenon, are based upon truth and are but the bewildered reports of various observers. They know that these people were temporarily lifted above the ordinary plane of consciousness and were made aware of the existence of a being or beings higher than mortal. It does not follow that they saw God or the Absolute, for there are many beings of high spiritual growth, and the development would appear to the ordinary mortal as a very God. The Catholic doctrine of angels and archangels is corroborated by those among the yogis who have been behind the veil, and they give us reports of the divas and other advanced beings. So the yogi accepts these reports of the various mystics, saints, and inspired ones, and accounts for them all by laws perfectly natural to the students of the yogi philosophy, but which appear as supernatural to those who have not studied along these lines. But we cannot speak further of this phase of the subject in this lesson, for a full discussion of it would lead us far away from the phase of the general subject before us but we wish to be understood as saying that there are certain centers in the mental being of man from which may come light regarding the existence of the absolute and higher order of beings. In fact, from these centers come to man that part of his mental feelings, 
that he calls the religious instinct or intuition. Man does not arrive at that underlying consciousness of something beyond by means of his intellect. It is the glimmer of light coming from the high centers of the self. He notices these gleams of light, but not understanding them, he proceeds to erect elaborate theological and creedal structures to account for them. The work of the intellect, however, always lacking that feeling that the intuition itself possesses. True religion, no matter under what name it may masquerade, comes from the heart, and is not comforted or satisfied with these intellectual explanations, and hence comes that unrest and craving for satisfaction which comes to man when the light begins to break through. But we must postpone a further discussion of this part of the subject for the present. We shall consider it again in a future lesson in connection with other matters. As we have said, our next two lessons will take upon the inquiry regarding the regions outside of the consciousness of the ordinary man. You will find it a most fascinating and instructive inquiry, and one that will open up new fields of thought for many of you. Mantram, Affirmation I am a being far greater and grander than I have as yet conceived. I am unfolding gradually, but surely into higher planes of consciousness. I am moving forward and upward constantly. My goal is the realization of the true self, and I welcome each stage of unfoldment that leads me toward my aim. I am a manifestation of reality. I am. End of section 17. Recording by Marion Servasi.